My name is Mary Giuliano, and I will be narrating the presentation for the Fernie Heritage Cemetery Restoration Society, presentation of the life and times of Fernie, 1890 to 1950, as part of the New Horizons for Seniors grant, Government of Canada, 2019. The project description was twofold, to collect biographical materials through oral interviews and or written surveys from seniors who have family members and loved ones buried in the old section, the heritage portion of St. Margaret's Cemetery in Fernie, British Columbia from the late 1890s to the 1950s. And to include summary materials concerning the internees on the Fernie Heritage Cemetery Restoration Society website, fernieheritagecemetery.com for worldwide audience. Some of the significant interviews and findings are demonstrated in this video. Much of the collection will be archived and published on the website. Show me the manner in which a nation or community cares for its dead. I will measure exactly the sympathies of its people, their respect for the laws of the land, and their loyalty to high ideals. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land. buildings and their membership have stood the test of time and are still a viable part of Fernie and the Elk Valley. post offices of the Elk Valley opened and closed with the existence of their communities. This map shows names of post offices of the Elk Valley 
from 1898 to present. I will wait forever if I have to accept my Memory is a painter. It paints pictures of the past and of the day. I will wait forever if I have to accept my fate and dream of ever after. Days go by. I long to hear the laughter from your
want to thank Jim Rawson and Herma Posniak for sharing their photographs and memorabilia spanning 1920 to present. Jim and Herma both passed away shortly after they contributed their materials, but they are appreciated. Diversity of early settlers and their descendants. Fernie was built on ethnic diversity of both Eastern and Western Europeans. This segment features short clips of interviews from the descendants of the early settlers of Fernie. And today my guest is uh, George Wilson and I think that a lot of people will recognize that name because your family has been here for decades. Uh, yeah, decades for sure. Uh, my, I was thinking on my way over here this morning, my great, great grandfather, W.R. Wilson, was the president of the Crow's Nest Pass Coal Company in 1899. Wow. Uh, that's how far back the Wilsons have been, and residents of Fernie at that time. Because that was kind of the beginning of Fernie. The beginning of Fernie and the beginning of, and of course, Fernie was founded on coal. Juliano and my guest today is Alex Gredzek, who is a longtime Fernie resident, I think born and raised here. Right, Alex? And so we are here to talk about the life and times of residents in Fernie. And I'm starting with uh, Alex. Thanks for agreeing to come on, Alex, and talking about your life with me. So tell me where you... We're born here in Fernie. Were you born in the hospital? I was born in West Fernie. In, our in West house. Fernie. Yeah, the midwife, I guess, at that time, I think, was Mrs. Sangella. Wow, you remember yeah. the name? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. 1932, March 18th, 1932. 1932. Yeah. What was Fernie like when you were growing up, when you were a kid? West Fernie then. From what I know of it now, it was beautiful. Yeah? It was beautiful. Everybody knew everybody. Well, being in West Fernie, we were kind of segregated from the town, mm -hmm. but we went to school down the north to the high school or the Fernie school. Mm -hmm. And after school, we come right back to West Fernie. Eh? We more or less stayed with ourselves down there. It was like one big family in West Fernie. With me today is Mary Menda. Welcome, Mary. Well, I'm you. so happy you agreed to come and talk to us about life and times of Infernie. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure to be here. I made a few notes. Yes, I um, wanted to start with um, perhaps uh, the gist of the entire thing. One of the characteristics of Fernie is Fernie has never been a city of lawyers. There were always people who, if something was needed, there was someone in town who would see to it that it was done. And these were ordinary people who saw needs. And I, I'm happy to say that even at this time, with new people moving in, um, they are following, they're, they're also volunteering and they are um, looking after the needs of the community. And I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, the 40s. I'm going to start with a um, the swimming hole that we used to swim at in the annex. Um, there were, that's, that's, that's not the same one as what was in Rotary Park, though, was it? No. This no. Was a that was one? a swimming pool. Ah. The swimming pool in the 40s was in uh, disrepair. It, it, they didn't have the money to uh, repair the swimming pool. So it must have been open in the 30s. And I, I'm not sure when, mm -hmm. but certainly in the early 40s it was not open. Oh, okay. And so there were swimming holes. And, um, the, for instance, all the North End kids would swim at a place called the Cribbon, and it was uh, pl uh, at the end of the, um, the golf course road. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the Annex people swam, actually, um, almost a little further on from where the Duck Pond is now. We swam there. And all along that, during the, um, during the Depression, I understand, they had make-work projects. So they, were, they built cribbing, it was called, and it, they were... Um, it was to, to keep what is presently now the dike, to keep the, the river from washing away more of that land. 
And uh, there was first pier, second, we swam at third pier. There was and my special guests are Marjorie McLennan, her husband Malcolm, and their daughter Kim McLennan Robbins. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So we're here to talk because I know that both of you have lived here a long time. Were you, were you born here? I was born here in 1942. So was I. And I'm sure you were too, Kim. I was born here in 62. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, whose family was here the longest? Because I know both Probably your family. Was... My dad was born here in 1903, but we moved away during the war. We moved up to the coast, and because dad, dad and mom got jobs in the shipyards. So we spent all the war time there, and then after the war, we moved to Vancouver for, for three years. And then we come back to Fernie in in '49. So we've been and you've here, been ever, here since. ever since. Yeah. So you went to school here mostly. Yeah. yeah. Most of my schooling until mm -hmm. grade ten. Mm -hmm. Then I joined the forces. Ah. Yeah. Were you sent overseas? No. 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 no I I was I joined between the, the Korean War and the Vietnam, so I was lucky. Basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was Fernie like? when you were growing up here? Oh, it was a quiet mining town. Everybody knew everybody. You walk down the street, you say hello to everybody. Now, it's, we're, the, we're the strangers here. Yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying. It yeah. does seem that way at times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My guest today is Don Barnett. Now, some of you will probably recognize his name and probably his face too because I met Don because of him being involved with the Community Channel, and I can't remember how many years ago that was. Yeah, well, yeah, it was called Shaw Cable in those days. No, not Shaw, Monarch. Monarch, Monarch yeah, Cable. Yeah, Monarch Cable. Yeah. It was near the end of the Monarch Cable era. Yeah. Shaw came in and things all turned over, but up until that point, as a hobby, when I came to Fernie, I got into uh, interviewing people and uh, old timers around the town. And, and they told me some of their stories. But when I came to Fernie... Mm -hmm. That's what I'd like to hear. I came from Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. and I came here, and my wife said, well, we looked at different places to retire. And uh, she said, well, let's settle in Fernie because it seems to be a town with a story. Hmm. So, so that kind of drew us to Fernie. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's a nice place. It's in a nice setting. And... Uh, it was at the time when the ski hill, when Heiko first, he, he just was selling the ski hill. Mm. And we looked at lots down in the annex and elsewhere. And uh, I went uh, to another town to look there, forget which town. Came back, and in the meantime, it was announced Heiko had sold the ski hill. And prices jumped by three and four fold. And lots that we were looking at for two or three thousand dollars were now eight and nine and ten and twelve thousand dollars, and that happened within a few days, almost you would say overnight. Hi, thanks for joining Life and Times. My guest today is Joe Warshawski. And Joe, you were born here. Um, tell me what you remember of the years growing up here, which would be when. I I was born in 1955 and I spent most of my childhood and everything in Fernie and around the Annex area. And the areas like that we're sitting in right now, there was always lots of fields and lots of people would uh, cut the hay by hand and everything was pretty loose and cannon before that. Huh. So you were born and raised in the well, this area called the Annex, yeah. which at that time didn't belong to the city of Fernie, right? No, we were part of the, they called us the Annex Extension, but the cutoff would have been um, 11th Street was the cutoff. So on the south side where Salvador's lived, that was the city of Fernie, and where I lived across the street was like a regional district, we'd call it today. Oh really? Like from one side of the street to another? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, so there was hardly any houses. There was, um, everybody had animals. I remember my my father raised uh, rabbits, New Zealand whites. They were a meat rabbit. Uh, chickens, geese. My mother uh, liked goat's milk, so we had goats. And uh, 
people would, uh, my dad would sell the rabbit, I think, for two bits a rabbit. Hello, and my guest today is Shirley Ashmore. Mm -hmm. Shirley, were you born in Fernie? Yes, I was. Because I, I wasn't sure if you were or not. Yes, I was. And who were your parents? Um, John Strong and Margaret Strong. <laughs> Strong or yeah, strong? Strong, S-T-R-O-N-G. Yeah. Ah. There's no, none around right now. No. no. Were you an only child? No, no. There was five of us. I was the youngest. And the rest of all moved away? They did, yeah. yeah. But you stayed here? Well, I went away for my education and right. I came back. And, yeah, and I, I always liked Ferdy. It was always my... I like the mountains and the winters and the, mm -hmm. just the whole atmosphere here. So I always made so are, are your parents buried in the old cemetery? Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the old cemetery. Yeah, and I have a sister there. Yeah, that's buried. Yeah. Here is a short video clip of Heiko Socher hiking in the mountains he's so loved, film, filmed by Helmut Emmert and Don Barnett. Hello, uh, I'm Don Barnett and this is Elk Valley Conversations. We're out here with uh, Heiko Socher beside me, and uh, the month is September, the year is 2002, and uh, tomorrow we are going to uh, participate in the inaugural hike of one of the premier mountain uh, hike, uh, hiking trails in this area. It's officially registered as the Mountain Lakes Trail, uh, but we're going to call it uh, by the name that everyone calls it and knows it by around here, uh, Heiko's Trail. Uh, uh, Heiko and uh, uh, his wife, Linda Socher, have uh, uh, hiked uh, uh, this trail several times from uh, both directions. I talked with Heiko uh, Socher, uh, uh, former ski hill owner, uh, mountaineer, outdoorsman, and trail builder. Uh, Heiko, thanks for uh, coming on here and uh, spending a few minutes with you. With us, uh, how, how long uh, have you been working uh, constructing this trail? Well, the idea originated two years ago, and last year I started working on it uh, to uh, get an outline of it and get permission from the Forest Service. Oh, okay. And and, and what was up here when you uh, came up here? Were there other trails or uh, anything much? Well, I found this uh, old portable sawmill setting here, uh, first of all. Okay. And beyond that, uh, people have hiked and uh, skied, ski toured, and snowmobiled, uh, but there weren't really any trails there. Okay, and, and now you have been working hard on a daily basis to uh, get this trail in shape and, and in order, and that's why we're able to hike it tomorrow. Uh, any particular reason why you're pushing so hard uh, uh, to, to get this trail done this summer? Well, this year I've spent uh, a full month I'd say uh, 35 days working on the trail, long hours, uh, with the help of other volunteers. If you think this is a trail, <laughs> I have to inform you, it's meant to be a trail. <laughs> Only the first part has really been worked on the fence. Did you start to hear the waterfall? I think it's up on the top of that cliff that's up there. We hiked from Hartley Lake toward Island Lake Lodge and before long we passed the historic abandoned sawmill and were soon in the ladders and walkways up the steep terrain. Before the 18 kilometer, eight to 10 hour hike would be over, we would experience rain, warm sunshine, wind, thunderstorms, and pellets of snow. We were on a mountain trail on a mountain day. <laughs> 